If you'll take your Bibles and turn to the book of Hebrews. I had thought earlier in the week of uh, where to go after Exodus, and I thought it might be good to give us a break from the law. <laughs> because uh, if we go into Leviticus and Numbers, we get to cover much of the same <clears throat> information told them, not by accident. Like the Gavalinis told me about the difference between little boys and little girls. Most little girls, you can tell them a few times and they get it. And little boys, you have to tell them and tell them and tell them and tell them and tell them again. But hard-headedness can have its benefit when it comes to good things and righteousness. Like the Dietrich Bonhoeffers that remained hard-headed in the Lord Jesus under great persecution. And I was not too hard to find an appropriate occasion, even in the first chapter of Hebrews, for the resurrection day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And opening to the very first chapter of Hebrews and reading what some people call uh, the Lord's resume, there in the first few ver verses, giving so much detail about his character and his person and and who he is, but I wanted to cover it in a sense this way, that what does the resurrection mean to us? Y'all have likely heard the story of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson on their camping trip. That Watson and Holmes, while well, they went camping, and one night in the middle of the night, Holmes woke up, and he looked up, and he elbowed Watson in the side, and he said, Watson, Tell me what you see. And he said, I see stars and stars and planets. He said, more than I can number. Holmes said, yes, 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 Watson. But what, 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 what does that tell you? Watson said, well, you know, astronomically it tells me that there's many galaxies and an innumerable number of planets and stars that we can't begin to number. He said, astrologically it tells me that Saturn is in Leo. He said, meteorologically, it tells me that tomorrow it'll probably warm up pretty quickly and be a nice day. He said, orologically, it tells me it's probably about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And theologically, it tells me that we have a vast, vast God that created all this that we can't begin to understand. He said, why, Holmes, what does it tell you? He said, Watson, you idiot, somebody stole our tent. And so, like, there's meaning, and then there's meaning. And sometimes we overlook the elephant in the room for meaning. <clears throat> and I know to our culture, without sounding, sounding too much like a cynic, you know, the meanings of Easter, and what does it mean? And all week I heard online in, in advertisements of candy cannons and Easter bunnies and helicopter candy drops and, you know, bounce houses and... And whatever thing, you know, and that's, that's what it means, and that's what it means. And, and we can go and take the ad academic approach and very generically and simply look at it. Well, what does Easter mean? Well, it means that the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead. But looking beyond that at the ramifications of that, what does it mean? And what does it mean to us that he rose from the grave? And it's not too hard to pick out a few things from here regarding the meaning. I'll read just a bit and pray because I need to. It says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past by the fathers, I'm sorry, in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had he when he when had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And let's pray. Father. 
Lord God, let it not be in vain. God, that I have reserved to this vessel, Father, for your glory and the work of the ministry, God, that there might be something today for all of these whom you love. And God, some of us in the throes of the trouble of this world and in persecution and in trials, God, some spiritually asleep and lollygagging and apathy and complacency, God. But truly, each Father here needing a real anointed word, God sent forth by your Holy Spirit, God, not merely by the voice of a man. And Father, we do this in confidence, knowing that since the beginning of time and all through, even, Lord, the old covenant and the new covenant in which we are under, God, that it has been, as you just said here, that you spoke to the fathers by the prophets. And indeed, Lord, they pointed forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. And now today, Lord, we point back to the Lord Jesus Christ and the very thing that we celebrate today, his death and his resurrection. So, Father, we pray for nourishment, God, where we can grow, Father, for wisdom, whereby we can learn, and God, not just learn what is right or wrong, but learn to do that which is right, as you gave in your great commission, teaching them to observe whatsoever things, not teaching them whatsoever things. So, Lord, I pray that you do not leave us to ourselves. God forbid that you should ever have words for us as you did Ephraim, that he was joined to his idols, and leave him alone. Even in our rebellion, God, we do not want to be left alone. But we cry out to Abba, Father, and as you commanded, come boldly to that throne of grace. God, we know what sort of men and women we are, God, but we know what sort of a man you are. What sort of a God that you are, that you're merciful, and you're long-suffering, and you're patient, and you did not give your Son in vain, but you gave him that we might have victory, and that we might be your witnesses. And so, Lord, in these last days, God, I pray that you deal with us as if it was an emergency. Lord, to wake us up to righteousness that we might not sin because some don't have the knowledge of you. Father, equip us with your Holy Spirit and the gifts that are to be given unto the church to do the work of your ministry, to be those ambassadors for Christ, Lord, to do the real thing, God. Be merciful unto us and gracious unto us, Lord, and speak to us through your word, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> now, God, who at various times and in various ways, polymeros and polytropos, very similar. Poly, we know what poly means, right? Many. And meros and tropos, many in many portions. Maybe it'd be well to translate it on many occasions, in many portions. And boy, I learned traveling in India, you had to watch out for many portions. Because you'd go and you'd go somewhere to sit down and they would, they would minister unto you with many portions. And if you were kind of goofing around and, and eating your food and you wanted to sit back and, you know, relax at the table, they'd come along, you know, and boom, they'd slap some more food on your plate. And, you know, boy, you know, and you, you feel obliged to, uh, to eat it. And in many portions, you know, they are serving you and blessing you. But in many, on many occasions, and in many different ways, and boy, isn't that ever true. You begin reading in the very beginning, and how in so many different ways, even the way, even in the very beginning, how he took an animal and, and killed it, and clothed Adam and Eve with those, and he began speaking to us at a time and in a way, even at that point. And we could fast forward over a number of different ways and times all the way 
to the time of Noah when the ark was to be built and judgment was coming on the earth and and he created an ark and the Lord said that it was you know that the end times would be likened to the days of Noah when he created this ark who was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ a refuge of salvation to escape the judgment of God and there was a time and a way in which he spoke unto them and we can go through through all the different typological examples of of the Lord Jesus Christ in Moses or in David or in Joshua and see all of those different times and ways that he spoke and then even into the prophets in some very strange times and ways. Very strange. I mean, I think we would almost be guaranteed that if we saw some man running around naked for three years preaching the judgment of God, we'd say there's no way that that can be the instrument of God. But it happened. I think it was Ezekiel for 430 days who laid on his side, on one side, for 430 days as, as an illustration to the people that for that many years they would be in exile. I believe it was also Ezekiel who actually cooked his food publicly with human excrement to show the desperation that the people would have in judgment. I believe it was also Ezekiel, if I remember correctly, that cut off his beard with a sword, which would have been a shameful thing to do. And, and with a third of it, he burned it. And a third of it, he cast it into a wind. And a third of it, he chopped into pieces. And only a small remnant was retained on his clothing, the Scripture says. Now, that's a lot of different ways. And a lot of different ways, even if we fast forward into the Gospels, which through his Son, the way he spoke to us, and even the way he spoke to us through his Son, beyond his death, and his resurrection, and the preaching of his disciples. How many times did the Lord Jesus Christ give a parable, trying to get us to get it, trying to get us to understand it, trying to do all those things? And in that we can see the love of God, but in that I also need to see another thing, is that we have a great accountability. We have a very great accountability, especially us, as Americans, so we call ourselves United States citizens, maybe a better word, because, you know, I had a history professor in college, and, and you know, U.S. history, and he, and he wrote, he said, if you refer to your country as America, you will get a zero. He said, you don't live in America. He says, you live in the United States of America. And he was a, he was a particular guy, but I know the way we use the word. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ, one of the things that it means is that we're accountable. We're desperately accountable. I know that people have developed cases, you know, for his death and his resurrection. And many people have wondered and said, we, Jennifer and I even talked about it this week, even secular historians, you know, for the most part, any of them that have a level head would not dare say that he didn't exist or that he was not crucified. Because if they were to deny that history, they would have to throw out most of Roman and Macedonian and Assyrian and Babylonian history, and, and their whole career and studies would be on a bunch of nothing. But if we're to believe in Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great, we certainly must at least believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, because his accountability and knowledge is not only biblical, but it's also very well accounted for in secular history. But we're accountable, especially those of us who have his words have had not only the times now in the ways directly through his son, but that we have the account all the way back to Adam and Eve. And all of those various times and various ways have been shared unto us. And what a great accountability that we have that he's been resurrected. And that it's for us fact and for the rest of the world extremely Strong evidence. But it means that we're accountable through these various times in very ways. And, and it says that in these last times, right, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Now, here we go. And I guess the dispensational uh, theology is going to come out of me. But, you know, I can't help but these last days, these eschatos. When Jesus said the hour is coming and now is that the, that the dead and the craves will hear his voice when the, the aura, the, the time, the period has come, 
that he speaks of it. And everybody knew that he wasn't talking about like, you know, we all know that he's not talking about a 60 minute hour. But really what the word means is the time, the time period, the hora. If you speak Spanish, it makes a lot more sense, you know, because you know, like, la hora que quiere decir que it was ahora, ahora mismo, ahorita, and a little, uh, you know, this exact time, time, ahorita, in a little time, you know, like, and, and so, but, you know, if you go to Mexico, you know, ahorita may not really mean a little time. They may say ahorita, but it may really mean a long time, you know, but that's, that's because of, you know, Mexican culture, not because of, you know, what their word really means. But be, before our culture, before the Western world, before that 60-minute hour clock, we just happened to grab that ancient word to stick it on that 60-minute time period to say, this is how we're going to redefine it. But for the Lord Jesus Christ and for all those you know, in historical propriety to this, they understood that it was a time, a time period in which they're in. And here he says, in these last time, and here what it, the word is eschatos. In the last days. And you know what that means is that means that we're in this time period called the last days. You know, I could say, well, you know, what about, uh, you know, bomb building? And there was this time period in which they, you know, did R&D and they talked about building the bomb. And then there was the build time where they built the bomb. And then there was another brief little time where they started the time bomb, and now there is another time in which we're waiting for the bomb to detonate. That's the time period that we're in. We're in this time period that has a finality that we're unsure of, and we don't know when it's going to come, and the Lord Jesus Christ said that nobody knows, but it's in these times that we're living, and so far we're 2,000 years into it, this time period. And if we go back and we read what the Lord Jesus Christ wrote regarding the end and the day of the Lord, that we can look about us and look around us and geopolitically, you know, come to the conclusion that we're getting pretty close. We're getting pretty close, and I can, one thing's for sure, we're closer now than we've ever been, and nobody can argue against that, right? You know, you're older now than you've ever been, and we're closer to the Lord's return than we've ever been. That is for a fact. But in these last times and in this time period, we call it the church age. It's the age in which the saints, the church, the ecclesia, all those who believe in Christ are giving witness unto him, and his gospel message is being spread around the world, and there will be a time when he returns. But he's in these last days, he spoke to us. By his son. And he goes on to describe this son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, Whom he has appointed heir of all things. Now, if his heir was dead, he could not be the heir of all things, but his heir is resurrected, and so he is the living heir of all things. I was at an auction yesterday sitting around forever waiting for the one thing that I was interested in buying to come up for auction. I was pretty sure I was going to have a birthday go by. You know, Beans was passed out sitting under a trailer. You know, I was wishing I could do the same. And, but at the beginning of the auction, I, they said, well, this is our auctioneer, old so-and-so. And, you know, and he went off, you know, saying something. I don't know. All I hear is numbers every once in a while, you know. And I can understand the numbers. Beyond that, it sounds like, you know, a foreign car wrapping out at max RPMs, you know. But, uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. It has that little thing going off. But, and then he said, and this is the owner. This is the heir to the estate. It was an estate auction. A man in his 60s. I looked over the guy in the brown jacket, and he was in his 60s. And I thought, man, his dad must have been pushing 90 or so. Maybe in his 80s. But he was the heir of all things. And he chose to deal with the, with the inheritance and the estate in that way, which I don't blame him. Boy, one day and you get it over and, and this guy, he must have been some kind of ranching farming cowboy because he had tractors and trailers and four wheelers and side by sides and, you know, all this stuff. And, you know, big, massive ta ta tables full of horse tack and saddles and bridles and and all that, and I took forever to get to that trailer that I was interested in. But he was the heir of all things. 
That, that meant that he was the authority of all those things. That he had the final authority. I don't know if there were siblings or I don't know if there was, you know, other distant relatives that wanted to stamp their feet and say, but that's my trailer. I want it and I want that. War. I'm sure you, none of y'all have ever gotten into those inheritance things, you know, where, where, you know, where people want this or people want that. But the bottom line is, is this guy was the heir. He was the heir. He had the authority and he had the authority to say, yeah, this is staying and that's going. And they lined it out before us so ahead of time. Now, this truck back here is not for sale, and that's not for sale, and that's not for sale. All this other stuff is for sale. And I just say all that to say, well, do you understand what it means to be the heir? That he's the final authority, that he has the authority to, to say those things, and, but not as he only the final authority. Look a little bit further. It says, through whom also he made the worlds. He's not only the final authority, he's the original authority. He's the creative authority. He's the one that formed that thing. He's the one that invented, that created, that put into existence. And if you go home today and you make yourself a chocolate cake, well, you can purpose to make that chocolate cake, to slap it into somebody's face or to give to your husband. Right? 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 Why? Because you're the one who collected the resources and paid for them and, and put them together and, and you made them and you're the, you're the creative authority of that chocolate cake and we understand that very well. I can't remember what, what that guy's name is. He's a, he's a crude, cynical comedian, but boy, did he ever get the abortionists. He said... Uh, he said, I know what you say. He said, it's not a baby yet. <laughs> he said, but what if I go and he says, and I make a chocolate cake and I put it in the oven and five minutes after it's in the oven, you go and you take it out of the oven and you sling it across the room. And, you know, and I say, hey, you destroyed my chocolate cake. And he said, well, you, then you're going to say, well, that wasn't a chocolate cake. And he says, well, it would have been. <laughs> he said it would have been. And I, I love it because he's not a Christian man at all, but he could certainly see the reality in it, couldn't he? He's the creative authority. That he made all things, and not only that, but he's also the heir of all things. He is the, the creative authority, and he is the final authority. And that tells us that he's the boss. That tells us that he's the boss, but also in, in that we can arrive at something else that tells us that there's a judgment. I think we're all familiar with the appropriation of funds for a purpose. Even churches are accountable for the funds that they use and that we use, and we keep records of funds so there's a record. And if anything is ever called to question, and they said, hey, what did you do with our tithes and offerings, you know? And I said, well, you see that nice house down at the coast? You know, they know. <laughs> no, 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 you know, we have to go back. Right? You know, because it's not my money. It's not the elder's money. You know, we don't have, you know, that sense of authority over it to use it for whatever we wish to use it for. We understand here in the situation in which we work, it's the Lord's money. And we're accountable for how we use it. You stop and think about the, his creation and how he created it with a purpose and an intent. You go back and you read so many of the, of the parables that he gave, even the parable of the sower. And as he went and he sowed that seed and he sowed it with an intention, right, that it would grow and that it would produce. And he was well pleased with that which fell on the good soil. And it was the loss of those that fell on the other three substrates. He gives parables like the talents, how he went and he entrusted something to, you know, those people with talents and how he came back with an expectation of the use of those talents. He gave, you know, parables of, you know, of the land, you know, owners that entrusted the land to farmers and with an expectation of how they would use those farmers. And when the landowner returned, well, there was judgment to be had. He gave an ex you know, parable of, you know, inviting people into a wedding feast 
and his expectation is that they would come and that they would honor the bridegroom. And when they did not come and honor the bridegroom as he intended for them to do so, he sent his servants out to kill them. You see, all over Scripture and all through the, the parables that the Lord Jesus Christ taught us, you know, that he gave us examples and illustrations that taught us that he created and he appointed and he entrusted with a purpose and an intent. And he was the creative authority, the appointing authority, and now he's also the final authority, which means at the end of your life, even if you're in, in the Lord Jesus Christ, you still have to give an account for what you've done in the Lord Jesus Christ. We call it the Bema Seat of Judgment. And if he's resurrected, well, the fact is, is there's a judge because all judgment has been entrusted unto him. As he said in John chapter 5, he said the father doesn't judge anybody. He says he's, he's committed all judgment unto the son. And that should be a terrifying thing. I think people have lost their perception. We have so played the Lord Jesus Christ down as a bro and some hippie-like figure wearing sandals and with a flower in his ear and a smile on his face, and we forget that he was the Lord that cleansed the temple twice and drove him out with violence. We forget that when Daniel had fasted for three weeks and he was there by the Tigris River, that the Lord Jesus Christ appeared as as if he were barrel, it said, with eyes that were like flame of fire, and his light shined like it was lightning, and he was so terrified, and the men that were with him were so terrified, and, and Daniel couldn't take it. He just fell down. He wasn't just some pushover bro. He was something to be terrified of. You know, in the, in the revelation given unto John, it talks about men who are going to go into the cracks, the cracks and crevices of the earth, into the caves, and they're going to be in great terror, and they're going to say, hide us from the Lamb. Terrified men. Paul gave an account three times in the book of Acts of his encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. And he said, then, you know, he said, a, a great light shone about them, and they all fell to the ground. I think about, you know, when a big explosion goes off. I remember us setting off a few pounds of C4 in the Army. You know, and if you're close to it, boy, boom, you know, it hits you. You know, and if you're down, you're down again already, a little bit more, you know. You're like, goodness, that was a concussion. That was a blast, wasn't it? And I think about the power that must have been there immediately. And even those tough Roman soldiers that were there with him, but boy, they fell down to the ground as well. And they couldn't understand the voice and they couldn't comprehend what was going on, but they were terrified. John gave an account in, on the island of Patmos as he was in a you know, on worshiping on the Lord's day, and he went into a trance, into a vision, and that same glorified Jesus that appeared unto Daniel appeared unto him. You know, it's interesting that all of the appearances of Christ outside the land were in a glorified form, and all the Christophanies that happened within the land were in a human form. It's interesting in that sense, and I don't know if I can expound on that or if I even know how to expound on that, but I I thought about that this week in those three examples. That was Babylonia. That was on, you know, on the road to Damascus. And, then, and, um, and the third one was on Patmos. And all the other Christophanies given it to Abraham and to, and to Jacob and to jo uh, Joshua. Well, they were all you know, with the captain of the Lord. You know, a, a man and you know, two other guys with them, angels with them. But this one who's coming to judge... Well, the first time that the Bible described him as a lamb, the second time they describe him as a lion. Well, I grew up on a game ranch, and we had, well, it was a big game ranch, like 17,000 acres, and we had thousands and thousands of exotic game on the ranch, lots of herds. And so some of the Texas zoos entrusted to us uh, some jaguars to either babysit or to retire when they were ready to retire them from the zoo. And I don't know if you know, but not by many pounds uh, less, a jaguar is the third largest cat species. And 
they're not little kitties. They're big kitties. You know, and they get up there around 400 pounds. And I remember as a kid just being enamored and, and a little bit terrified at these jaguars. You know, every About twice a week we would go and maybe we might happenstantially come across an animal that, you know, died in the trapping process or... Or if not, we would just go out and shoot an odd dad sheep or something. And sometimes we'd have a hunter shoot a, uh, a an animal that wasn't delightful to eat. He just wanted the cape and the mount, you know, and he couldn't transport the, the meat back with him. And so he'd leave it with us. And, and so we'd take, you know, that animal carcass and we'd take it over there to these big cages that were, of course, you know, sides and top and heavy, heavy gauge wire. We had these trap doors that went up and down, and we would just take an axe and, and just very, you know, generally quarter the animal, you know, into big chunks. And I remember as a kid, you know, watching these fence-building, hole-digging, not-weak ranch hands, right? You know, swinging an axe with one hand, like, boom, you know, chopping the, the leg quarter off of this animal, you know, and they'd... You know, pick up that leg quarter, you know, maybe 40 pounds, something like that. And, you know, they'd have to, you know, make sure the animal was back. They'd lift up the door and they'd, you know, heave that thing in there as far as you can throw 40 pounds. And I'd watch that cat just come over there and he'd pluck that thing up like you were plucking a piece of tissue out of a Kleenex box. You know, like it was go, go gadget claws, right? And just a whoop, you know, and he would just, he'd reach out there and just kind of swat it and just, Pick, pick it up. Boom. And I thought, man, you know, that's heavy. And he just, like it didn't weigh anything. And that cat would just pick it up like that, and he'd get it in his mouth. And then he would jump up, you know, on a, to a platform six, seven feet off the ground with that 40-pound chunk of meat and bones in his mouth. And man. And then they would start chewing it. And he would just crunch, crunch, and the femur and whatever, whatever, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. What was he, all ever see those videos online where they got this, you know, recycling thing that just chews up whatever you throw in it. And they like to throw crazy things in there to see whatever it will just tear up. And I just remember sitting there listening and I knew how tough these sheep were and these goats were and these, you know, animals were that we were throwing in there and they would just start crunching. You could just hear the bones crunching, crunch, 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 crunch. And then there were times at night when I'd walk from the lodge back to my house within 100 yards or so of those cages. And I thought, boy, I hope that jaguar's still in that cage. <laughs> and there'd be times when we wanted to show our friends, you know, the, you know, the jaguars. And, you know, even if we had other young kids come to the ranch, you know, like, you want to go see the jaguars? And, you know, and I'd, I remember my imagining, imagination just getting carried away. And, and as we'd approach those cages and you couldn't, you couldn't see them and they were back there in their own man, man-made cave. And sometimes, you know, you'd even get back there and you couldn't see them in your cave and your imagination would terrify you and you'd say, well, what if they're not in there? Oh, goodness. And you think about how he plucks that up and crunches that up and just and just a 400-pound ball of violence that could totally maul you in a second. It was scary. It was scary. Yet people don't stop to realize that the lion is not in the grave. He's not in the cage. It ought to be terrifying to those who don't believe. That there's one and he's not contained, he's not in the ground, he's not held down by death or anything like that, but he's out and he's the lion. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah and his next coming is going to be coming as the judge of this world and to bring in his kingdom and, and uh, it should be a terrifying thing, what is to come. But he's the judge of all things. I'll flip over just for giggles in... in in uh, just John chapter 5, isn't it? It's interesting that John, although it's the presentation of the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lamb, yet I think that it accounts for more teaching on the judgment of Christ than any other gospel. John 
He said, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. He said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. He said, Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he, has, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, the hour is coming, in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those that have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. What does the resurrection mean for us? It means that he's the authority and that judgment is coming. If the judge was in the grave, he could not judge, but the judge is not in the grave. And it's a certain reality that should sober us up, you know, as Christians to awake to righteousness and to live our life for him and as unbelievers to very quickly call upon him to be saved, because we don't know. We don't know the day and the time and when all we know that all that call upon him shall be saved. It tells us that Christ was the perfect representation of God. It says that through whom also he made the worlds, but in verse 3, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by his word, that Christ was the perfect representation. You know the claims of Christ, what it means that if he, if he was resurrected, if Christ, you know, a wise man said that Christ was either a liar or a lunatic or he was Lord. One of the three, right? You could say that he was a man, man, madman. You could say that he was a liar or he really had to be Lord. It would be one thing if he claimed to be a prophet. But this was the man who came and he claimed to be the son of God. And with that claim, there was an authentication of a resurrection that nobody else can give, you know, an, exa uh, a, a, an explanation of. We think about... Uh, you know, Gautama Buddha. Buddha has a grave, right? And Muhammad, Muhammad has a grave. And all of these religious leaders of the past, they have a grave and they have a grave. But when you think about Jesus, he does not have a grave. I know they like to find places and they, you know, they think pretty strongly that this was a tomb or maybe that was a tomb. I notice that whoever owns or controls the real estate, that's the one, you know, that way, you know, <laughs> you know, it must have been this one. Of course, there's no bias there, right? But it doesn't matter. We don't have a certain place. Although the Pharisees, some of the most powerful people of the time, would have very much loved to be able to mark the place in the body, but they could not. Although the Roman soldiers, I can assure you, would have very much wanted to be able to give an account for the body of Christ, but they could not. You know, and nobody could, and you know, the people of power and the people in power, and even the people afterwards, that they could not give an account, and he's not there. And that him being not there, being resurrected, well, we know that what he said was good. That what he said was true, that the Father did honor him, that it was true, and that is who he said that he was he is who he said he was and not only that but this and this also he's this express image of his person and that he upholds all things by his word you know that's still going today the scripture says that he ever liveth to make intercession for us what does it mean that he was resurrected we don't you don't you know we don't get it we don't properly appraise it we might as well be you know, in something like a Boeing 747 with a glide ratio that's something like 280-something to 1, which means it goes this way, you know, like it's, that's how it glides to a stop, you know. And, and Jesus is your parachute. He's the ticket. He's the only thing that you have. He's the only credential. He's the only thing that someday you're going to have to walk a bridge, right, that, that crosses over hell created for the devil and his angels, and the bridge is the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's the only thing 
after your death. That's the only credential. That's the only hope. That's the only one who can give a word for you. That's the only thing that will save you because we're not actually saved now. We're justified scripturally. If you go over to Romans, much more, having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved, is what the scripture says. And we shall be saved, it means that we shall be saved from the judgment to come. And the only thing that stands between us and that great and terrible judgment in which, you know, the big and the tall and the small and the rich and the poor and all of the above, it says that we'll stand before him. And they'll have to give an account. The books will be open. And the only thing that will save us is this certainty that Christ is risen from the dead, that he upholds all things by his word, that Christ is going to be there to say, he's mine, she's mine, I know him. Christ and nothing else. I'm not sorry. You'll have to forgive me without apology that I, I, I can no longer... I can no longer tolerate in our culture all of these things that we have put in the place or that we share the spotlight of the Lord Jesus Christ with. It's not good. While we swim in our cultural ignorance of his righteousness, we have gone about to confuse and to dilute Christ, even on this day, with all kinds of diversions and entertainments and cool tricks and funds and gags and stuff to appeal to our American consumerism, and I, I can't do that with good conscience anymore. I'll tell you what it's like. It's like, you know, like all of us having a disease, and we need, and then there's one particular thing that we need to eat as a cure or as an antidote or something like that. You know, and you need to invite people over. But the trouble is, is this thing, it doesn't taste good. It doesn't look good. It doesn't smell good. It doesn't feel good. You know, there's a texture issue, a smell issue, a, a side issue. And, and, every, and everything about your flesh doesn't like it. And that's the truth about the gospel message. The gospel message, when, when Isaiah 53 said he had no form or comeliness that we should desire him, I just don't believe that was about his physical body and appearance. I believe there was much more about that, that us in our flesh and our natural self, there's nothing there of ourselves that would desire him because the cross and the gospel of Christ looks unto us like a grave. And that's what it is. Take up your cross and follow me. Take up your electric chair or your lethal injection. Take up your, your means of execution and follow me. And follow me into the baptism of my death and die unto yourself that you might live again. And that is, that is the antidote. And that is the thing that we have to lose ourselves and repent of our sins and to believe on him. You know, but the trouble is, is that the church today wants to take that thing that is not popular, that is not, you know, you know, doesn't look good, doesn't smell good, it's not appealing to our flesh or our senses, and we invite people to the, to the banquet, right? And we put it in the middle, and then we surround it with, you know, apple cobbler and ice cream and brisket and all these other things. And listen, you know, we, people will never get to the thing that they need with so many diversions. I don't know if, you know, people across this nation this morning will get a clear vision of Christ in the spotlight because there's so many other things. I don't want to confuse. I don't want to distract. Boy, the very thing that we need is Christ and Christ alone. He's the only one. He's the only one to be there. The Easter Bunny cannot be there to mediate for you between the Father and you. He will not take dyed eggs. <laughs> you know, as it's in exchange for your soul or something like that. And I don't think I'm being ridiculous because we've been about this gag and these gimmicks for some 20 or 30 years now. And if you think that the church is making headway and progress in our nation and our culture, you have to open your eyes and watch the news. You have to watch private news. You can't watch public news, you know, because they, even they won't tell you the truth, right? <laughs> and so... It's horrible. It's horrible what we've come to and the point that we've come across. But listen, what does it tell us? It tells us that we're accountable, that there is a Lord, that he's the creative authority. He's the final authority. It tells us that the judge who's been risen from the dead is alive to judge. It tells us that he's the perfect representation. 
And by the way, if we just went forward a few verses, you know, the writer of Hebrews quotes Psalm 45, and he tells you what this perfect judge loves and he hates. In verse 9, he says, You, speaking of the Lord, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. This Jesus with whom we have to do with, that's the way this book puts it later on, this Jesus with whom we have to do. He's the bouncer at the door that you can't get around. Well, who is he and what is he like? He loves the righteousness of God. He hates lawlessness. And the bad news is that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But that there's another thing, last thing, is that uh, upholding all things, by his word and his power, says when he had by himself, by himself. It's just Jesus, not Jesus plus. It's not Jesus plus your good works. It's not Jesus plus your right group denomination by himself. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. That Jesus by himself purged our sins, and he sat down by the right hand of the majesty on high. And that's the best news about the resurrection. A dead Savior can't save anybody, but he's not dead. And a Savior in the grave would be no good unto you. I think it was in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 <laughs> that Paul went on a rant. He says, some of you are saying that Jesus did not rise and the dead don't rise from the grave. He said, if that's the case, we have no hope. And if Christ did not come out of that grave, then we should all not meet here next Sunday and stay home and find our very best hobby and thing that we like to do the best because we would have no hope. There would be no point in a dead Savior, but he, he lives. And the scripture says that he ever liveth to make intercession. You know what else the scripture says? He said, because I live, you too also shall live. That's the hope of the resurrection. And that's what it means unto us. I'm going to pray and I'm going to let Tim take over here so he can lead us in the Lord's Supper this morning. Father, thank you, God, for your word. Let it be our wisdom and our instruction, God, to who you are, Lord, and to the things which you love, to the things which are pleasing unto you, God. We pray for your gospel ministry, Lord, that that good news of the Lord Jesus Christ would go out with the effectiveness of the ministry of your Holy Spirit, God, to convince the hearts of men. Lord, even those here, here this morning, God, who have not believed on you, God, that you might open their eyes to their sin, their need for you, and invite them into a relationship with you, Father, as you said, no one can come unto you unless the Father draws him. So, God, we pray that you would draw men and women, children alike unto yourself, God. That our work, Lord, that the task that you'd given unto us might be fulfilled and might be performed. As you said unto your church, and go and make disciples. And then again, you said unto them, Lord, you shall be my witnesses. So, Lord, we pray, God, that you would make our witness good and the sharing of your word effective, God, not to harden the hearts of man, but God to soften. And that the return that you would get would be those believing upon you for salvation, Lord. That's what we desire to see God cause us to be a church about your business. Lord, work in our own hearts, God, that we might be a healthy church, a strong church, God, that we ourselves, Lord, might be living a life of worship unto you, God, sanctified and set apart, God, holy unto you, God, vessels not intended for you know, the, the revelry of 
of Babylon, God, but in vessels intended for your ministry. God, for the ministry in your holy presence, Lord, may we be those kind of vessels, Father. Lord, I pray that you would graciously, God, work in each of us to that end. Bless my brother as he comes this morning, God, to share the truth of your word, Father, to share the Lord Jesus Christ with us, I pray in Christ's name. Amen.